So welcome to this tutorial which is going to look at forces in DOPS, that is in Houdini Dynamics. But before we get into that I'm going to set up a scene which will allow me to demonstrate some features of DOPS. So first of all I'm going to lay down a grid and I'm going to lay down a sphere and I'm going to reduce the size of the sphere considerably. And then I'm going to lay down a box and I'm going to dive inside that as well and reduce the size of the box. And what I'm going to do is lay down a, another geometry node here, which we're going to use in a minute. But first of all, I'm going to go into this grid and I'm going to create a group, group geometry. And I'm going to create a group of points, which I'm going to call alternate points. And I'm going to use the group by range form of the group node to select every other point. And as we can see, that produces some neat rows of selected points. I'm now going to jumble that up by inserting a sort node here in between. And I'm going to make it a random sort. So that should mean we get a random selection of every other point in our grid. The next thing I'm going to do is insert a blast node and I'm going to delete all the points that are in the alternate point group. And if I display points we can see that a bit more clearly. And then I'm going to, with that selected, Control c Control v I'm going to delete non-selected, which will give me everything else. And then I'm going to add a null to the end of this. And I'm going to call it Other Points Out. And I'm going to put the display flag back on our first blast. So I'm going to call these boxes. And then in this other geometry node that I lay down, which I'm going to call spheres, I'm going to get rid of the file node and I'm going to do an object merge. And I'm going to bring in the other points out form of our geometry. So that's going to be all of the points that aren't in the first in the boxes node, all of the other points in our grid are going to be in the spheres node. And then the next thing I'm going to do is use our rigid body tools here to create two RBD point objects. So let's select the tool. The first thing it asks me to do is select the object whose points will be used for instancing. Well, in that case, I'm going to use my boxes object with my cursor over the 3D window, press enter. And then I'm going to select the box and press enter again. And that's going to create a box on every single one of those points. So the second part is to select my tool again, select my spheres object, press enter, and then select my sphere object, press enter again. And that's going to create spheres at all of the other points. So that sets up our scene nicely. Well, let's just make a couple of tweaks to our Autodoc network to make things move a bit faster later on. And what I'm going to do here on the boxes RBD point object is change the collision type to implicit box. And on the spheres, I'm going to change it to implicit sphere. And that will just help speed things up later on. Now with our Autodoc network, we've automatically been given a gravity node here at the end. So there's already one force acting on all of our objects. As we can see, when we press play, they all fall down. And if we look at them, we can see that they all fall at exactly the same rate. 
Let's have a look at one of the other forces that's available. And I'm going to do that, first of all, by disabling the gravity node by clicking here on the left-hand side. And then I'm going to add a uniform force. And a uniform force simply exerts a force in a single direction. And in this case, I'm going to make it a force of 10 going upwards in the y direction. And it exerts this uniform force on all of the objects. So we can see that it's having an effect. But what's happening is our boxes are moving up more quickly than our spheres. And the reason for that, of course, is that unlike gravity, the uniform force is affected by the mass of the object. And if we have a look at our boxes and our spheres, we should see that they both have the same density. Well, at the moment it's saying use point value. Let's change that so that they're overriding the point value with a density of 1,000. If I rewind and play again, we can see that the boxes are still moving more quickly. And the reason for that, of course, is that our boxes are slightly smaller than our spheres, so even with the same density, uh, the boxes are lighter. And Newton's law states that force equals mass times acceleration. In other words, uh, the acceleration that a force creates on an object is equal to the size of the force divided by the mass of the object. So a heavier object will accelerate more slowly than a lighter one when subjected to the same force. Let's have a look at one other use of the uniform force node, which is to create torque. Let's uh, delete the force in the y direction and put a torque force of 10. See what happens. Well, we can see uh, that it's spinning all of our boxes. It is actually also spinning the spheres, but you can't tell that because the spheres are, are circular. So a torque force creates a force that tends to rotate the objects around their own pivot, the own, their own center of gravity, and it does that round the axes. So if I produce a value of 10 here, then those will start rotating around the x-axis. Let me rewind, like so. So that's torque. Let's go back now and have a look at our gravity node. And we can see that although it doesn't have a torque parameter, it does have a force parameter that's very similar to the uniform force parameter here. And indeed, you can use gravity essentially in the same way, a gravity node, in essentially the same way as a uniform force node. The difference between the two, of course, is that gravity produces the same acceleration independent of mass on each object whereas a uniform force takes into account the mass of the object. Well, before going on to have a look at some of the other forces that are available in DOPS, I just want to say a few words about how to control which objects are affected by your forces. So to do that, I'm going to put the display node on the merge and delete both of our forces. Well, one way to choose which objects a force affects is to use the shelf tool here. And on the drive simulation tab here, we have all of our forces. So let's select uniform force and make sure we've got nothing selected first. So select uniform force and it invites me to select some dynamic objects that are going to be affected by our force. So I'm just going to select a random group of our objects and then I'm going to press enter and what we should see except I'll need to increase the force let's give it a value of 30 upwards and what we should see is that those objects which I selected earlier 
are being affected by the force and the rest are not. Well, how is this being achieved? Well, in this case, if I have a look at my uniform force node, we can see that it has in the group parameter here a list of names boxes 6, boxes 12, boxes 22 and so on. And these are in fact names of individual objects which are being created by the boxes and spheres node. And if we have a look in a details view we can confirm that and we can see that we have a whole load of objects called boxes something and then a whole lot of objects called spheres something. So I can use uh, this group parameter to select the objects that I want my force to apply to by name. So let me just revert to defaults, get rid of everything. And instead of having what we had before, I'm going to put boxes star. So that should, that wildcard should match every object whose name starts with boxes. And let's see whether that works. And what we should find is that our uniform force will now apply to the boxes and not the spheres. And there we are, we can see that that's indeed what's happening. You can also set up groups in Dynamics. And you do this by making sure that you're in your dynamic object selection mode here. Making sure you're in selection mode and then I'm going to shift select a number of objects here just randomly and then with my cursor over the 3D view I'm going to hit the tab key and I'm going to start typing group and I get this option group dynamic objects so if I select that we will see that at the end of my chain of nodes here in the Autodot network I've got a group node and it's calling it group naught. I'm going to make it my group and it's got a list of those objects which I selected. Now in fact if I want to use this group I'm going to want to put it before my uniform force node so let's just rewire this so that the group is before the uniform force and now instead of using this wildcard here I can select my group and what we should find is that the items that we just selected are affected by the force and nothing else is. In fact the group parameter is common to almost all nodes in DOPS so that you can use it to select which nodes affect which objects. And just a quick aside to show how this works within the details view. We can see here that uh, the uniform force is applying to the objects here. So box is 16. It's one of the objects it's applying to. So if I open up box is 16 in my details view, we can see that there's some subdata here called forces and there's a uniform force as part of that. And as you'll recall from the other videos on DOPS, or if you haven't seen them, uh, just to recap, the nodes in the DOP, net, DOP network are not actually processing any data. All they're doing is creating this tree structure here uh, with data, uh, rather than actually doing the work as they would do, for example, in a SOP network. So what this uniform force node is doing is adding this uniform force data to those objects which it applies to. So in other words, for those objects which are listed here in this group mask. So for example, box 15 is not in that mask. So if I look there, we can see this doesn't even have the forces subdata. So what's happening is the Uniform Force node is only adding its data to those objects that are passing through it and which also form part of my group. 
Well, let's now look at a couple of ways in which you can modify the effects of a force. And both of these apply to pretty much all of the forces that are available in DOBS. And they're to do with attaching some subdata to your force. And if we have a look here, most of the force nodes have this second connector, which is a data connector. And one of the things we can do is connect a noise field. And what a noise field does is produce a random number, or in fact, by default, three random numbers for every point in space. And it then multiplies each component of our force by that random number. And let's revert this back. So let's change this. I'm not going to go into the parameters for generating noise. They're common to all of the ways of generating noise in Houdini. But I am going to reduce the frequency a little bit. And I'm going to make the minimum value for this noise minus 1 and the maximum value 1. And what we should now see is that when we play this, some of our objects are moving upwards and some are moving downwards. And the reason for that is because at each point in space, the value of this ranges from minus 1 to 1. And our force here has a y component of 30. But if at that particular point in space the random number happens to be minus 1, that's going to convert itself into a force of minus 30 pointing downwards, which is why some of our objects are going downwards. Notice that none of our objects are moving along the z or the x directions. That's because the force value here in the x and the z direction is 0. So whatever value of noise we multiply this by, is still going to produce zero in those two components. Let's change that. Let's revert to a force of 10 by 10 by 10 and see what effect that has. Well, we can now see that everything is moving in a random direction in all uh, against all of the axes. And the reason for that is that each component here is being is being multiplied by each component of the force uh, each component of the noise rather which varies between minus 1 and 1 so we're going to get a random movement in each direction when we put uh, a force of 10 by 10 by 10 what happens if we, what we actually wanted to do was have everything move in that direction 10, 10, 10, so in other words, in the direction here of the, of the control. Uh, but we wanted the noise just to affect how fast they moved in that direction. Well, the way to achieve that, uh, and first of all, I'm going to revert this so that the minimum value in each case here is 0. The way we can achieve that is by setting the noise to generate scalar noise. And when we generate scalar noise, that produces just a single value for each point in space and multiplies each component of this by the same value. So all it's going to do is scale this up and down according to where we are in space. And what we should find is that everything starts moving up in that direction, but some things have a greater force, force exerted on them than others. And we can see that, that is indeed what is happening. Let's just have a very brief look at how uh, you can examine this in the details view. If we have a look at one of our boxes, we can see it has forces data, has our uniform force, that's what's being created by this node here, but then it also has subdata. You can see it's deeper in the tree, comes underneath the uniform force. We have our noise and that contains the options that we've put into our noise. So the uniform force is looking for some data attached to itself, attached as subdata, and it's looking for this noise, and it uses that to affect how the force applies to each object and varies it randomly across space.
Just one other remark on noise, which is if you want to vary your noise over time, then you can use the offset parameter to do so. For example, I could put in here $st. $st is equivalent to $t. In other words, it's the time, but it's the time within a simulation. So $st, and that's going to offset our noise calculation by a different amount at each uh, moment in time. Of course, if we want this to work, we're going to have to change this from use default to set always, so that this value is updated at every frame. And what that will do is ensure that the noise varies over time.